Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for the organization of this series which will allow us all to talk about fairy tales which we rarely can do in the normal life. Right, um, and as Alison said, uh, today we will be screening the film of 1946, uh, The Stone Flower in Russian, it uh, is called Kamin Cvitok, exactly the same thing. And uh, I will take maybe 20 minutes, I'll try to be very brief introducing this film because I think it deserves the introduction and it should be somehow contextualized. <coughs> Basically, this film, by its plot, um, depicts uh, the Urals, the area of Russia, somewhere in between Siberia and the central Russia, which is um, very famous by its minerals and by its uh, stone craft, craft uh, the, the stone carvers, the stone carvers. And the entire uh, story here runs around such uh, mineral as malachite. malachite. Um, now malachite is gone in Russia and whatever is being done there is done uh, of malachite brought from Africa. But, but stone carvers are still there and it's still very famous uh, trade there, sort of the mark of the spirit. Um, this uh, looks, uh, this film will, will look like it depicts the situation vaguely in the 19th century although the literary source depicts also quite vaguely uh, the period of the 18th century. But this shouldn't uh, deceive you. Basically, it's a very Soviet tale, and um, it was created in the late 60s, uh, sorry, in the late 30s, in the late 30s, and the fame to this uh, book came in uh, 1943 when it received the Stalin Prize in the midst of the war, imagine that. <coughs> the author of the text or the book on which this film is based is uh, Pavel Bajov. Pavel Bajov, who uh, he was born in 1879 and died in 1950. And uh, this book basically made him a celebrity. Before it, he was not known as a writer at all. He was a provincial journalist working in different party newspapers, writing uh, some, some documentary books, history of the Civil War and, and likes. Um, but uh, when this book was released, at first in, in the Urals, then it was republished in Moscow, and then it got this uh, Stalin Prize, um, in three years, very, very quickly, I'd say, especially considering the wartime, the movie that you will see today was made, it was made uh, by a very famous film director about which I want to say later a few words, Alexander Ptushko. And uh, this was one of the first, actually the first um, entirely color film made in Soviet Union. Um, and uh, of course you, have, you will see the remastered copy and it looks very well, at least for my eye, and I guess it looked pretty uh, stunning back uh, in 1946. Um, no wonder it received the special prize for the use of color uh, at the first Cannes Festival, which was also in 1946. Um, later, in a few years later, a uh, famous uh, Russian composer, Sergei Prokofiev, uh, had written a ballet um, uh, under the same uh, title, The Stone Flower, and this ballet was produced in Bolshoi Theater, and it's still produced sometimes. It's not that popular, but it was a, a big thing. Right, and uh, it, it is really hard to find a work of uh, the period that was so quickly transformed into the instant classic work and, and uh, film and ballet and multiple re-editions, multiple uh, illustrations, so it became some kind of the cult work, which surprisingly is almost entirely unknown in the West. That, that's why when I was asked what to show, I picked this one. Um, the first translation of this work in English appeared in the 50s, and it was done by the Soviet publishers, and they used the commentary and translators, for some reason uh, it was translated in, in sort of Scottish dialect of English because 
the Ural dialect, the Ural form of Russian that is being used in, in the book and in the film is not a typical Russian language. So what made this, this book, this collection of stories as a matter of fact, so popular? The, the initial uh, book was titled uh, Amalekite Jewelry Box and it consisted of 14 tales from the old Urals. Old Urals. Right? And um, it, it is possible to explain the success of this book from the standpoint of the socialist realism, the, the official method of the Soviet art, which was promoted since the mid-30s. Maxim Gorky, when he was uh, giving his famous speech at the uh, first Congress of Soviet Writers, where he actually um, introduced this concept of socialist realism, spoke a lot about the connection between the socialist realism and folklore, and he was arguing that the socialist realism is a new form of folklore which actually uh, generated uh, a whole bunch of uh, quasi-folklore, it was called fake lore, right? Uh, the, 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 the texts that were done in the folklore stylistics and supposedly created by the masses, but in fact it, they were created by the group of writers, right, sent somewhere. Um, and Bajov's work, which was positioned as the sort of based on the folklore, Ural's folklore, fit it nicely into this tendency, especially because it was the workers' folklore. Russia is traditionally a peasant country, and therefore a lot of folkloric texts were of peasant origin, and here it's about workers, those who, at least craftsmen, so it, it, it fitted much better into the doctrine, right? However, however, the, the, the contemporary research shows that there is no such folklore that, that Bajov used. There are some motifs, some very fragmented, uh, not even tales, rumors about various mountain spirits uh, and uh, masters of the mountains that, that circulated amongst uh, the, the miners, amongst uh, stone carvers and lights. Mainly, mainly, uh, Bajov created his own original mythology, which he just, you know, wrapped as a folklore. And uh, it is also interesting that despite this, uh, this, this uh, correlation between the socialist realism, the doctrine that was heavily promoted in the 30s and 50s, this work of art survived the end of the Stalinist period and even the end of the Soviet period. The, the various productions, cinematic and animated productions based on Bajov's tale, Tales um, appeared in 60s, 70s, 80s, and continue appear to appear even now. Um, uh, to, to my great surprise, I even learned that in the early 90s, in the southern Urals, there appeared a neo-pagan sect that used Bajov's book as their sacred book, <laughs> with, and with this very serious belief into all mythological creatures that he had created from his head, as a matter of fact. Also, uh, how to explain this? Maybe by the fact that this book, despite its popularity, was quite unusual amongst other works of the period, and especially among those which targeted both children and adults. The, 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 this, the, this book had double sort of address. Uh, it, is, it is pretty dark, I would say. It's full of mysteries. It rarely has happy endings, or happy endings are of very peculiar, kind. And uh, this fact may be explained by the circumstances uh, during which this book was created. The fact of the matter is that <coughs> when um, Bajov was writing these tales, he was expecting to be arrested. Uh, furthermore, the situation was even funnier. He was summoned to the NKVD in the, in the very high point of the terror in 1937. And he was already expelled from the party, fired from his job. So there was only one way from this position into the Gulag. And so he is summoned into the office of NKVD. His wife packs this little suitcase, which he can take into prison with him. He goes there, he sits down, he waits to be called into the office. He sits and sits. There are lines there, you know, it's the Soviet organization. Soviet organization. There are lines. And so the time comes to the end of the work day, the offices are being closed, people are leaving, and Bajov, instead of, you know, knocking the doors, demanding to be accepted and 
proving that, that he is innocent, of course, he takes his suitcase and departs to his little home, his little house. I, I live nearby this house, so I know, know it very well. It's very modest. And for a year and a half, neither he nor his wife just, just leave this house. In, uh, and they leave it only, only in the night time, just go for a walk. But basically they sit there and Bajov's sister, who was a teacher, she was actually feeding them. He hides there. He, he, he sits very, very, he keeps very low profile. He disappears. And apparently that was a very wise practice because, uh, as you probably know, in the 1937-38, the, the terror was going in an unpredictable way. And one of the sort of parts of the terror was the arrest of the NKVD leadership. So, so this happens and they forget about Bajov and this summon. And so he sits well, and in after a year and a half, he realizes that he can leave his premises. And but while sitting, and we can imagine how scared he was, right? He was ter terrified, right? He was waiting every second that they will come and arrest him. He was writing these supposedly folkloric tales. This 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 imprint of terror, imprint of trauma, is filled there, but indirectly indirectly in this in this atmosphere which is which is dark and um, and majestic at the same time and uh, I, I think that that these tales they also present some kind of the utopia utopia of escape very similar to what Bajov was trying to do while while sitting in this little house on Chipayev street uh, I, I'll speak about this utopia of escape in, in a few minutes but now I want to speak a little more about the central character that appears in this film, the mistress of the Copper Mountain. Um, and the mistress of the Copper Mountain, um, actually this is a complete invention of uh, Bajov. Um, and there are very vague mention of some, some, some lady of the mountains, lady of the minerals, but um, he presents her as the goddess, literally of the underground reaches, of all these minerals, of all these treasures, of all these beautiful things hidden somewhere in the mountain, right? Um, and uh, when, when one reads these tales and analyzes them, you will feel the, the, that this is a very uncanny creature, uncanny in, in Freudian sense of unheimlich. She's, she's, uh, dangerous, she undermines power, she's very attractive, she uses, uh, and at the same time she's associated with the underworld, with the world of death, of course, and cold stones, which is also very important there. And uh, it's not, <coughs> it's not um, by an accident that her familiars are animals that are usually associated with devilish forces, cats, serpents, she transforms into a lizard herself, and all these things uh, are present in the movie. Um, there is a theory that, that uh, this uh, image of the mistress of the Copper Mountain derives from the goddesses of indigenous people which, which inhabited the Urals and then they were pushed away to the north, marginalized, mainly eliminated, during the colonization of the Urals in the 18th century. But this, this is only one uh, theory and uh, what, what is mainly, mainly important here that this is some alternative goddess, right? Very much alternative to, to whatever is happening uh, on the earth. Of course, Bajov was my, masking this uh, alternative magic power by the fact that the entire situation is placed before the revolution, so dark times of czarism and everything happens there, but we, we should understand that, that he couldn't help projecting this situation into his own time. Um, usually in the fairy tales based on the notion of uncanny, uh, the, 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 the character, the protagonist confronts the uncanny and then returns to the home or rebuilds the home, creates the home, of course uncanny in Freudian language is non-home, right, anti home, unheimlich, right? Uh, but in Bajov tales, the home is not recreated as a matter of fact, or the home is very unstable. He prefers another um, ending for his tales, which is the escape of the character 
and uh, this escape into nowhere, literally. The, the characters in 14 of his tales, seven characters at the end of the tale just vanish in thin air, and it is said that the mistress had taken them into her kingdom, into her kingdom of you know, stones and, and uh, beauty. So it is, it, is, it is this utopia of escape, and it is this utopia that, in my view, resonates with the circumstances of creation. So Bajov was actually escaping into this mythology of the Urals that he was creating and trying to hide from the history that was happening around him. It is not just escape into the past, it's rather escape into the realm of uh, beauty, of eternal beauty, but cold beauty, dangerous beauty, even murderous beauty, I would even say. Um, and uh, the home to which uh, one can disappear in these tales um, from the terror of the grand motherland um, appears in Bajov's tales as a non-place. But this non-place, however, promises defense from the threatening social authorities. Uh, in the proximity of the uncanny, they have no power whatsoever, and that is what is so attractive about this. Therefore, in his tales, um, this mistress of the Copper Mountain appears as the alternative to the grandmother Russia, or rather to the grand imperialist mother Russia, the image that was created in the Soviet official art in the 30s, 40s and 50s. It is quite interesting that in his tales he constantly emphasizes the non-Slavic appearance of uh, this, this mistress. She is different, and we, we, which actually connects her with the indigenous people. However, in the film that you will uh, see, uh, the mistress of the Copper Mountain is presented in the very different way as the Mother Russia incarnate and, and very, very beautiful uh, actress which is associated with this grand narrative of the Mother Russia was selected for this role. So obviously uh, filmmakers felt the danger, the, the, the subversion which was hidden in uh, Bajov's tales and tried to, to, you know, to hide it uh, as much as possible. Right. Uh, a few words about the, the film director, Alexander Tushko. Uh, this is one of the most daring experimentators in uh, the Soviet film. He's uh, frequently compared with uh, Walt Disney and uh, Ray Harryhausen. In 1933, he had released the movie The New Gulliver, in which he combined stop-motion animation with uh, live actors. Stop-motion animation meant that, that he didn't use marionettes. No, these were dolls with, with some of them had uh, as many as 300 heads with different expressions which were shot stop-motion, so as, as animated films are done. And simultaneously there were act, uh, acting uh, live uh, uh, actors there. Later on he made in 1938 another it, it was long feature film, 80 minutes or more. Um, in the same technique, he made the uh, film based on the Soviet version of Pinocchio, The Adventures of Buratino, that's the film of 1938. Um, and uh, these experiments were, were very mm, different, and at the same time they correlated with what was happening in the Hollywood film of the period. and. Uh, his uh, work and uh, with special effects uh, in this movie that you will see, movie of 1946, even now is compared with um, Her uh, Harryhausen's Jason and the Argonauts and uh, Terry Gilliam's The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. So it was extremely inventive. It was very much unlike some kind of propaganda piece. And uh, therefore I hope that, that you will enjoy uh, this uh, film and that you will have many many questions and comments after we'll show it so and I think we should start right сделай мне шкатулку лучше такую чтобы глаз оторвать нельзя было красон до еду забыл ни о чем не думает только знает одно, 
шкатулку барину сделать, а работа не клеится. Два дня осталось, а шкатулка -то. шкатулка. Что хочешь со мной делай? Не моя работа, а чья, чья же? Его. Хочу, чтобы сделал он чашу. Непременно душенька сделает. Глядите-ка, что он у меня срубил. Да, чисто сработано. Сорок годов с камнем божусь. Пойди штук сто вас-то всяких вытащил. Да? А подобные сам не делал и у других не видал. Пойди, тот ты вышел. То и горе, что вроде живо, а живой красоты нет. Ой, сынок, не ходи по этой половице, а то угодишь к хозяйке Медной горы и ее мастера. Что обручение пришло в самый праздник хозяйки Медной горы? Сегодня в полностью дом камень расцветел. Вот ты и приходи к Змеегорку. Самая приданная. Что теперь насчет женитьбы скажешь? Не затем пришел. Цветок каменный покажу. А покажу, полюбишь? Не могу, говорю, потому другой обещал. Теперь сделаю чашу, какой еще никто не видит. У меня мастером моим останешься. Сила у тебя да власть большая, а только любовь сильнее тебя. Все равно уйду. Да какой? Данилушка! Данилушка! Испытывала я тебя. Бери своего мастера, Катерина. Пусть в памяти твоей все мое останется. It's 1946. What can we do about this? We could point it on a high, high speed. Yes. I had a question about the um, wedding ceremony. Was that sort of romanticized, or would that have been... Very similar? romanticized, okay. very romanticized. Uh, the, the first part of uh, when they enter, you can sort of... Uh, the talking, it somehow, of course, reminds the traditional rituals. The second part with the dancing, that, that, that's a typical Soviet folklore. Uh, that, that, that's how the folklore was presented by the sort of state sponsors, ensembles. And Basically, you see that the problem there is uh, they were trying to create some kind of the unified image of the Russian folklore, but there was no such a thing, because one folklore was in one area, another folklore was in another area, and the Urals is uh, a very strange area because, uh, as I said, there was indigenous population and there were people brought from very different areas. They were actually taken away from their traditional roots and some very much rootless culture was being created there and uh, it had elements from different uh, regional traditions and eventually something specific formed there by the 20th century but this is this is some kind of the generic poster like Russia that, that they're trying to present but that that was the style of the sort of grand style of um, socialist realism and its interpretation of folklore, I'd say. Is it the same director who did Psycho? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, Ptushko uh, made, made uh, quite a few uh, films. So actually he, he had a very long life and he um, was working actively uh, until the early 70s. And he did Satko and Roe, the, the, the film director uh, that um, Vicky will be showing his film later, is one of his uh, close disciples. He was in this group of film directors that they organized, and this group, uh, between 1936 and 38, they produced 14 animated films, which was an incredible film, it was, it was big, nah, because everything was done by hand. It was drawing and 
and uh, shooting every, every movement. Um, he also made the film that was quite famous in the 60s, um, Ilya Muromets, uh, the, the, this uh, um, sort of Russian epic tale on film. And it also has quite interesting masks and quite interesting uh, visual effects. Uh, Ptushko himself, he was not only um, a film director, he was also always in all his films, he was an art director. And he was literally painting every take of his movies. A few years ago, there was a big exhibit of his, of his paintings in New York and it had a sensational success. Uh, the New Yorker wrote about it as, as sort of the appearance of Russian surrealist. He was not a surrealist, he, he was creating this, this new style. And actually, by watching this film, I realized that with all these vases, he was bringing back Art Nouveau, which was completely pushed away from the sort of the Soviet uh, uh, repertoire of art styles. It was considered to be bourgeois, decadent. But all these flowers, this is perfect Art Nouveau. <laughs> you should go into the Art Nouveau, yeah. sometimes even Tiffany. Right? Um, and uh, so he definitely had very strong modernist inclinations, which he was you know, rendering through this uh, conventional, or more or less conventional form. Yes, You see, I, I'm not a film expert, so I can say very general things. Uh, yes, there were there were several. Uh, so sound sound was introduced. Um, the first sound film was uh, made in in the Soviet Union in uh, 1928, and it was titled "The Road to Life." It was a very and actually we have it in in Altec. It's a very interesting movie about the group of homeless kids who are being, you know, re-educated in this commune. Um, and it was incredibly popular. It was not entirely sound movie, so, so it had a lot of d d some dialogues, but there were still credits and, and descriptions, so it was um, in, in the middle. Um, but then uh, in the 30s, almost all Soviet industry switched to to the sound production and uh, the, the major films of the 30s are all sound movies and the comedies of the 30s uh, uh, made by Grigory Alexandrov and of course the, the famous films of Sergei Eisenstein who was the teacher of uh, Alexandrov who made the comedies and both uh, parts of Ivan the Terrible, the first and the second, which was actually completed in the same year as, as this film and they were actually uh, produced at the same studios at first in Almaty in Kazakhstan then they moved to Moscow um, um, after evacuation they were both sound movies um, and of course sound was very effective because uh, there, there is this famous phrase of Lenin uh, that, that from most uh, from all the art the most important for us are uh, movies and circus uh, circus is usually cut off uh, but, but that's what he said indeed. Uh, he, uh, and, and so the authorities, the, the, the communist authorities, they've seen the, the film mainly as a form of uh, sort of propaganda, right? And silent propaganda, of course, is less effective than, than sound propaganda. But also, uh, it's said that Stalin was an avid uh, film uh, viewer, and uh, there were films which he watched uh, dozen times, for instance, there was this famous film Chipaev of 1936, which he apparently seen 30 times, or, or some others, and for instance, when he had uh, these negotiations with, with Roosevelt about the, uh, the, the, the second, uh, sort of, at, uh, second front, as it was called, he supposedly uh, sent to him the copy of the movie Volga Volga, a very famous c uh, comedy, because of one line in the song that is being sung there that America had presented uh, a steamboat to Russia with huge wheels but with, with very slow move. So that, that was the hint, you know. So he knew this movie so well that he could, you know, impose the political meaning into the very innocent line, very comical line. So basically what I'm trying to say that although the, the movies were used for propaganda, they were definitely transcending these purposes. 
And basically, it was something very similar to, 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 to the Hollywood mass culture. It was also the factor of dreams, of different dreams, though. But uh, the formulas of dreams and the formulas of plots and the genres, they were very similar. Of course, there was also a lot of borings from, from, from Hollywood movies, but still, still. And the animation um, was, was also used. Uh, actually, animation in the uh, sort of Russian film starts to appear even before the revolution, in before 1917. And Tushko himself, the director of this movie, was a disciple of the very interesting uh, film director Starkevich, who emigrated to, to Paris and became an art director in France, and who made first uh, cartoons, um, not, 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 not drawn cartoons, but with, with, with toys, with, with, with toys, with dolls, about insects, and there was one more, I guess. They're very interesting, they're very strange, but very beautiful. And, and when you read that they are made in, in 1916 and then in 1918, it's, you can believe it. So there was a very high culture of, of production. I, I'm, I'm going away from the question because I don't know much for, for, for the clear answer. So in any, any other questions? Yes, yes, baby. So was this the beginning of when the Soviet government started doing the fake tales? Or you said that there was kind of a proliferation of the fake tales? Actually, it was not the beginning. It, it was, it was the, the later stage because the fake uh, lore um, flourishes in the mid and late 30s. And uh, basically what was fake or these were um, fairy tales supposedly written down somewhere in the remote area and epic songs, but epic songs about uh, collective farms, about the uh, leaders of the party, about the NKVD sort of uh, bosses. Uh, there were created several celebrities in this respect, sort of storytellers uh, that were accepted in the Union of the Soviet Writers. And they were, some of them were able to improvise on the given topic. Uh, some of them were improvising in uh, the languages that usually are not known for the majority of people, therefore they had a sort of uh, um, suite of translators and what these translators were translating nobody actually knew. So, so it was really hard because the guy was improvising and he could improvise for hours and hours. It was a very, very developed art. But then it was presented in Russian as a translation, nobody I cared to, to compare what he was singing and what they were producing. So that, that was uh, this kind of stuff. But uh, the film, of course, film is by definition fake lore because film cannot be the folk art. It's always the, the, the auteur's art. And uh, the first f um, film tales, uh, film fairy tales, filmic fairy tales appear uh, in the 30s and they, they immediately become very popular and some, some interesting style was developing there. Um, uh, the, there is a all the black and white film, uh, Vasilisa the Beautiful of 1939, which uh, actually has very interesting motifs of um, sort of external enemy and the woman who defends, who fights the woman fighter, um, and so on. So there was, there was a sort of, uh, it was not uh, exceptional. These films were produced at least once per year, right? And therefore the school of these filmmakers who were, who were specializing in, in, in fairy tales was very strong. I saw a couple of forces at play in the film. Mm -hmm. The main thing was the power of the heart mm -hmm. in a law. Yeah. And yet when the film ends, the old man says the two most important things are your skills and your mind. Yes. Well, there's an obvious contradiction, <laughs> I, I'd yeah. say. I'd say beca because basically uh, the skills and the mind are on the side of the mistress of the Copper Mountain, I'd say, right? Uh, I, I think there is a very mm, interesting sort of um, rewriting of this original tale because this motif of unfreedom is associated with the mistress, right? And the escape is the escape from her, uh, while in Bajov's tales it's usually escape to her, into her realm, right? Um, and so, so the, the fairy tale in the film is more 
conventional than, than the original text, which is, uh, which is used as, as the foundation for this plot. And uh, Bajov was one, the, the author of the text, right, was one of the co-authors of, uh, of the script. And I can feel here the, the contradiction between the sort of conventional um, romantic story, so, so sort of the voice of the heart, you turn to the voice of the heart, and his idea and his world in which the power of art, this power of beauty, this gravitation of the beauty is much stronger any earthly matters, including heart including her, because it's a very strong scene and then it's rarely seen in uh, the, especially in the movie intended partially for children, right, that the guy leaves his own, actually, wedding, <laughs> breaks his, uh, his piece of art, right, and then he's being seduced, quite methodically, right, by the mistress. And then after this, oh, I, 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 I was teasing, I was testing. No, she was not. Of course she was not. It's the struggle between two, two female powers. Right? And we may even interpret this as two images of, 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 of Russia, as two, or rather two ways of life, right? And uh, one may read it as sort of a drama of an artist. What, what, what should you choose, right? A sort of cold world of true art, which cuts you off from all your, you know, all people who are dear to you, or you return to, to the world of those who are dear to you, but you should sacrifice your art for this. And actually, the film ends uh, on a happy note, but if we start thinking about this, the sacrifice is greater. And uh, so, so it, 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 it is more interesting than, than the typical uh, sort of film plot of this kind, right? and even of uh, the traditional fairy tale, I would say. It is the fairy tale for the 20th century. Is Malachite, is that a very typical stone of the Urals? In the stone at, at, at that period, yes, it was. And uh, Malachite was, was sort of the trademark of the Urals, although um, ma many minerals are used there. Um, Malachite was considered to be the imperial stone. Uh, and uh, for instance, in the Winter Palace, there, are, there is the entire room made of Malachite uh, with, with the columns uh, covered with malachite and, and, and this huge vases uh, in the <laughs> very similar to those that we see in there, uh, also made of malachite. But basically, basically different stones are used there. Uh, jasper is also very beautiful. I would say that jasper is much richer in colors and variations. And uh, uh, when, when Katya brings her brushes, this is jasper. This, that, that's not malachite. A malachite is very difficult to work with. It, it, it constantly breaks. So, uh, it, and uh, that's why this spray, so how did you make this vase without breaking the stone? So usually, sort of second, uh, second rate masters, they, they use uh, glue. They, 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 uh, it breaks, they glue it up. <laughs> uh, and you can see, and, and of course the high class is when the stone is intact, the stone is not broken, and, and that's, that's what they praise. Um, there are, there are areas, there are villages, which uh, were at least uh, completely inhabited by stone carvers. There was some kind of specialization. So this, this village works on Jasper, this village works on Malachite, uh, those work with, with, with different other stones, this work, uh, they, they work with uh, silver and gold as well, of course. Um, so, and you can see that that's a very strange social setting there. So on the one hand, they're serfs. Right, they're serfs, they're not free. On the other hand, they are craftsmen. They have very, they have professional rating, right? There are people who, who have the right to say that this is good, this is bad, right? And basically, basically, they're much freer than, than typical serfs would be because they have their skills and even this, this uh, uh, manager, right, uh, this mediator between the master the, the, that came from St. Petersburg and uh, the craftsmen, he, in, in Bajov's tales, uh, he's a sort of infamous character who is uh, incredibly cruel, incredibly cruel, and eventually uh, the mistress punishes him and uh, kills him. Actually, she, she, she sort of absorbs him by the stone. He transforms into the stone statue. Uh, but he, even he is afraid to damage the craftsman, because the craftsman is above 
in many ways the, the social structure and social restraints. And that's, that's a very specific culture, which is, which is not typical for the rest of her. Yes. It's hard to say. I, 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 uh, you see, it's, it's depicted there as, as the exception, right? As the exception. But as far as I know, there were cases like that. There were cases like that, although they were, you know, singular cases. Uh, it, it's mentioned, of course, for instance, Malachites, and basically the, the, the stone carving, it's truly very bad for health. Uh, because Malachites, as I understand, it's, it's copper uh, um, function, right? And, and uh, you know, er, uh, any um, sickness associated with lungs is there, is there, and they're, they're, they're sitting and they're constantly sort of uh, breathing in this, this stone dust. So usually, ma first of all, man didn't live so long, and this, this Prokopich who is there and ancient old man, he's maybe in his late 40s, so in, this in this time period, Th that was sort of the time, uh, the, 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 the typical age when, when these masters used to die. So women, uh, they had big families, and women were running the household while, while these guys were, were, were getting some, some sort of earnings for, for the family. So it was not typical. But um, when uh, the woman was left alone, being a widow, that, that was the most typical right, of a widow who inherits her husband's trade. That, that happened. That happened. Um, and uh, there are records of this. Of course, in the film, it also reflects the, the sort of the, 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 the Soviet idea of feminism, which basically implies the double burden, so she has to prepare the food. Nobody releases her from the food preparation. And sort of in a spare time, uh, she, she does some stone carving, you know, ju just for, for the sake of the family. Um, but, but there were cases like that. 